Κυρίε και κύριοι, καλησπέρα σα. Είμαι ο Γιώργο Κατσιπαύλου και σα καλωσορίζω στην ψηφιακή εκδοχή του Summer Nostos Festival με τίτλο Retro Future, το οποίο μπορείτε να παρακολουθήσετε online όπου και αν βρίσκεστε. Από το κανάλι του φεστιβάλ στο YouTube, από τη σελίδα του στο Facebook και το Instagram και φυσικά μέσα από το site snfestival.org. Λοιπόν, σήμερα θα πάμε μπροστά στο χρόνο και θα παρακολουθήσουμε ένα preview από το εκπαιδευτικό πρόγραμμα της επόμενης χρονιάς με τον θρηλυκό σκακιστή Γκάρι Κασπάροφ, την Τζούντιθ Πολκάρ, τη σπουδαιότερη γυναίκα σκακίστρια και τον Τζον Ουρσέλ, πρώην παίκτη του NFL, του Αμερικανικού ποδοσφαίρου, δηλαδή American Football, ο οποίος αυτή την περίοδο ολοκληρώνει το PhD στα μαθηματικά στο Πανεπιστήμιο MIT. Ο Γκάρι και η Τζούντιτ θα συζητήσουν για την τεχνολογία και τον ανταγωνισμό και μαζί τους θα είναι ο Φρεντερίκ Φριντέλ, συνειδητής του Chess Base και ο Έλληνας Grand Master Χριστόδουλος Μπανίκας που θα μεταφέρει και θα θέσει ερωτήσεις από τέσσερις κορυφαίους μαθητές του. Ο Χριστόδουλος είναι μαζί μου. Γεια σου Χριστόδουλε. Α, λοιπόν, πρώτη φορά είδε τον ε, Κασπάροφ από κοντά το 1988, παιδάκι, έτσι, mm -hmm. στους, ε, στην Ολυμπιάδα Σκακιού στη Θεσσαλονίκη. Ακριβώς. Πώς είναι να βλέπεις το, το ειδωλό σου από κοντά. Ήταν ε, ίσως η πρώτη ή δεύτερη χρονιά που έπαιζα σκάκι. Είτε, είχε, ήταν η δεύτερη φορά που έγινε Ολυμπιάδα σκάκι στη Θεσσαλονίκη να πούμε και τελευταία φορά το 1988. Mm -hmm. Ήταν μόλις είχα αρχίσει τον αθλητισμό. Και είχα την ευκαιρία να δω τα μεγάλα μου ιδάλματα, τον Γκάρι Κασπάροφ, που φυσικά όλοι ξέρουμε ποιο είναι ο Γκάρι Κασπάροφ, αναφυσβήτητα, και την Τζούντιτ Πόλκερ, που ήταν πάρα πολύ νεαρή τότε, που ήταν το κορίτσι φαινόμενο, η καλύτερη απέχθρια στον κόσμο, και οι δύο αναδείχτηκαν πρώτοι με τι χώρε του. Και αυτό μου έδεσε το ένευσμα, εμένα προσωπικά, να συνεχίσω το σκάκι να... και να ασχοληθώ με τον πρωταθλητισμό. Και ε, να πούμε ότι έχει βγει και εκτό συνόρων, έτσι. Βέβαια, εκτό συνόρων είσαι Χρήστο, όχι Χριστόδουλο. Ναι. Ε, 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 εδώ υπάρχει μια. Δηλαδή, η διεθνή σου καριέρα είναι ω Χρήστο. Γιατί τώρα έγινε αυτό, έτσι, ε, προσωπική περιέργεια. Mm, κοιτάξτε, ε, το όνομά μου είναι Χριστόδουλο Βανίκα. Απλά επειδή όλοι στην Παγκόσμια Ομοσπονδία και όταν έβγαινα έξω από το τουρνουά, κανεί δεν μπορούσε να πει Χριστόδουλο. Και όλοι λέγανε Χρήστο, <laughs> Γεια σου Χρήστο, Γεια σου Χρήστο, Χελό Χρήστο. Έμεινε το Χρήστο και έτσι στην Παγκόσμια Ομοσπονδία το ID μου γράφηκε ω Χρήστο. Οπότε και εγώ αποφάσισα, α είμαι με ένα καλλιτεχνικό όνομα. Ναι, okay, ναι. κάποιο δυσκολεύτηκε και είπε Χρήστο. Ναι, Χρήστο, δεν βαριέσαι. Να σου πω, πε μου, ποια ήταν α, η, η στιγμή εκείνη που α, είπες αυτό θέλω να κάνω. Ε, δηλαδή, βλέπει τον Κασπάροφ, αλλά mm -hmm. πάμε λίγο στη, στη, στα, στα, μέσα από τα παιδικά σου μάτια. Τι έγινε εκεί. Θα σου πω, τι, τι είδη με εντυπωσίασε σε εκείνη τη στιγμή όταν είχα πάει στην Ολυμπιακή. Ε, θυμάμαι ένα τεράστιο κτίριο. Ε, ήταν μέσα στο στάδιο, στο στοιχέλεξο στη Θεσσαλονίκη. Και ήταν ένα τεράστιο κτίριο που παίζανε κοντά στα χίλια άτομα, στο οποίο δεν μιλούσε κανεί. Και ακουγόταν μόνο ο ηλεκτρονικό θόρυβο από το ρολόι. Και ακούγεται μόνο το τίκτυγα από το θόρυβο, και έβλεπε κάποια άτομα να σκέφτονται και να λε τι προσπαθούν να κάνουν. Δηλαδή, δεν μπορούσα να καταλάβω φυσικά και δεν ήξερα σκάκι, αλλά μπορούσα να καταλάβω ότι αυτοί οι άνθρωποι σκεφτόντουσαν, καλλιτεχνούσαν και θέλανε κάτι να κάνουν, κάτι να, να δείξουν. Αυτό μένα μου τράβηξε πάρα πολύ το ενδιαφέρον, γιατί νόμιζα ότι ήταν πολύ βαθύτερο το νόημα του σκακιού, και έτσι σιγά σιγά άρχισα να μελετάω. Οπότε από μικρό βγήκε από το Αρτή Ελλάδο, μετά πήγα στο εξωτερικό και αυτό μου έδωσε το ερέθισμα να παίξω και να βρεθώ ακόμα και αντιμέτωπο μαζί του. Και να αλλάξει και, και όνομα. Ε, λοιπόν, έχει παίξει με τον Κασπάροφ. Ε, το σκορ ήταν. Με διέλυσε, με διέλυσε, με διέλυσε. <laughs> Είναι φανταστικό παίκτη ο Κασπάροφ. Να, να σε ρωτήσω κάτι. Υπάρχει κάποια φορά που έπαιζε στη, στην ιδιωτική του ζωή, σε επίσημο αγώνα, ο Κασπάροφ και να άφησε τον αντίπαλό του να τον κερδίσει. Και καλά, έτσι, για να χαρεί λιγάκι ο αντίπαλο. Όπω μου έχει πει και ο ίδιο, ε, μερικέ φορέ που έχουν βγει έξω, ούτε τη μητέρα του. <laughs> δεν <laughs> υπάρχει <laughs> καμία περίπτωση των περιπτώσεων, σα λέω, είναι τόσο εγωιστή που θέλει να του κερδίζει όλου. Δεν, δεν, δεν είναι θέμα εγωισμού, είναι, είναι ο καλύτερο. Ε, αλλά σκέψου τώρα, να σε αφήσει να κερδίσει για να αισθανθεί καλύτερα, δεν θα το πάρει έτσι. Θα πα δεξιά και αριστερά και θα λε: Ξέρει ποιο είμαι εγώ. Έχω κερδίσει τον Κασπάροφ. Οπότε το, καλά κάνει και δεν το, δεν το ρισκάρει. Mm -hmm. ε, να σε ρωτήσω. Ε, Ας πούμε ότι θες να πεις σε κάποιον ο οποίος δεν ασχολείται με το σκάκι. Νεαρής ηλικία, μεγαλύτερος, αλλά θες να του πεις κάτι το οποίο θα τον κάνει να στραφεί προς το σκάκι, να μάθει, να ασχοληθεί. Mm -hmm. ε, τι θα του έλεγες, δηλαδή, σχετικά με το ότι δες το, κάντο, γιατί, ναι. ποιο ε... είναι το benefit, ποιο είναι το, το σπουδαίο πίσω από όλο αυτό. 
ε, διαχρονικά αυτό που έχω καταλάβει από τους μαθητές μου, τα παιδιά που αναλαμβάνω από ηλικία κοντά στα 10 ετών, 10 χρόνων οι νέοι μαθητές συνήθως που αναλαμβάνω, μέχρι να ενελικιωθούν, αυτό που διαπιστώνω και μου έχει εντυπωσιάσει το σκάκι είναι το πώς τους καλλιεργούν σαν ανθρώπους, πόσο ολοκληρωμένοι γίνονται σαν, άρχομαι, ε, σαν άτομα και πόσο επιμελείς γίνονται και στο σχολείο του και με στη μετέπειτα ζωή του. Γιατί το σκάκι και ο αθλητισμό, πέρα από τα καλά του αθλητισμού, το σκάκι σε βοηθάει στο να σκέφτεσαι, στο να λειτουργεί σωστά, στο να εργάζεσαι σωστά, στο να δουλεύει. Νομίζω είναι κάτι το ιδιαίτερο το σκάκι και θα άξιζε σε όλα τα παιδιά να γνωρίσουν τον αθλητισμό και το σκάκι φυσικά. Είναι αλήθεια αυτό που λένε ότι αν ένα ε, ε, σκακιστή κοιτάξει μια σκακέρα την ώρα που εξελίσσεται, ένα αγώνα, δεν βλέπει τα πιόνια, αλλά βλέπει έναν αλγόριθμο, βλέπει κάτι διαφορετικό. Δηλαδή, μεταφράζεται πολύ διαφορετικά αυτό σαν εικόνα στο μυαλό του. Είναι αλήθεια. Ναι, δεν βλέπουμε ποτέ τι κακέρα. Δεν χρειάζεται να δούμε τι κακέρα για να μετρήσουμε τι θα γίνει στην παρτίδα. Ακόμα και όταν προχωράμε έξω, προφανώς σκεφτόμαστε την παρτίδα μας. Πολύ ενδιαφέρον αυτό. Λοιπόν, πάμε να, να, να έρθουμε στην, ε, στη σημερινή συζήτηση που θα παρακολουθήσουμε. Τι, mm. τι θα δούμε σήμερα. Ε, σήμερα θα παρακολουθήσουμε μια πολύ ωραία συζήτηση που έχει. Ε, που σχετίζεται σχετικά με το πώς η τεχνολογία επηρεάζει τον ανταγωνισμό. Σε, πάνω σε αυτή τη συζήτηση θα μιλήσει η Τζούντιτ Πόλκαρ και ο Γκάρι Κασπάροφ. Τώρα και για την Τζούντιτ να πούμε ένα κορυφαίο όνομα στο παγκόσμιο στερέωμα. Τι, τι να σας πω για την Τζούντιτ, να σας πω ότι για τον Κασπάροφ δεν χρειάζεται να σας πω, το ξέρουμε όλοι. Η Τζούντιτ Πόλκαρ από το 1989, νούμερο ένα στον κόσμο, μέχρι το 2016, τιμήμαμε για πάνω από 25 χρόνια. Ε, έχει φτάσει μέχρι το νούμερο 8 στην παγκόσμια κατάταξη, μακράν η καλύτερη αθλήτρια όλων των εποχών. Ωραίωτατα. Οπότε θα το συμβούλευα και σε όλου του μαθητέ μου και σε όλου που παρακολουθούν και άσχετου με το σκάκι να το παρακολουθήσουν για να δούμε το πώ αυτοί οι άνθρωποι αντιμετώπιζαν τον αθλητισμό και πώ βλέπαν την τεχνολογία τότε που δεν είχαμε τα μέσα. Γιατί μιλάμε για μια εποχή όπω το 85, 80, 90, για αυτήν την εποχή μιλάνε και πώ εξελίχθηκε αυτό στην πορεία του χρόνου. Που έχει τρέξει με, με γεωμετρική πρόοδο η εξέλιξη όλη αυτή. Πάρα πολύ ωραία. Χριστόδουλε, ε, μπορώ να σου πω ότι ε, βλέποντα έτσι λίγο ε, αποσπάσματα από αυτή τη ε, συζήτηση που θα παρακολουθήσουμε τώρα, ε, εμένα ε, ήταν σαν να ξύπνησε λίγο ένα ενδιαφέρον ε, για το σκάκι, ε, το οποίο υπήρχε έτσι από τα παιδικά χρόνια που λίγο έπαιζα, mm -hmm. αλλά δεν συνέχισα ε, ούτε καν σε ερασιτεχνικό επίπεδο. Αλλά είναι μια ευκαιρία ε, όλη αυτή η συζήτηση να είναι ένα παράθυρο για να μπούμε σε ένα κόσμο που ε, κρατάω τη λέξη που είπες και ε, κάτι δύο να συζητούσαμε, στόχο προσήλωση, οργάνωση, που είναι πολύ σημαντικά ε, ε, προτερήματα για, για την ζωή, ό,τι δουλειά κι αν κάνεις, mm -hmm. σε όποιο τομέα κι αν δραστηριοποιείσαι. Λοιπόν, κύριε και κύριοι, ε, πάμε να παρακολουθήσουμε αυτή την πολύ πολύ ωραία συζήτηση. Χριστόδουλος, ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ. Και εγώ σας ευχαριστώ. Ένα βήμα στο μέλλον, στο ε, εκπαιδευτικό εργαστήρι που θα γίνει του χρόνου, έρχεται σήμερα. Γεια σας. Είμαι ο Χριστόδουλος Μπανίγας, Grand Mets στο Σκάκι από τη Θεσσαλονίκη. Είναι τιμή μου σήμερα να σας παρουσιάσω ένα sneak peek από το μέλλον. Το πρόγραμμα Thrill του Σκακιού, το οποίο θα μας δώσει μια πρόγευση για το τι θα ζήσουμε όλοι μαζί στο Νόσος University το 2021 στο πλαίσιο του Summer Νόσος Festival. Ο Γκάρι Κασπαρόφ έχει εμφανιστεί πολλές φορές στο φεστιβάλ που διοργανώνει κάθε Ιούνιο το Ίδρυμα Ταύρος Νιάρχος στο Κέντρο Πολιτισμού Ίδρυμα Ταύρος Νιάρχος. Στη φετινή online εκδοχή του, μαζί με τον Κάρι, συμμετέχει μια ακόμα θρύλος του Σκακιού και προσωπική μου φίλη, η Τζούντιτ Πόλγα. Η κοντισφότητα μα είναι ο Τζον Άρσελ, από τις Ηνωμένες Πολιτείες, ο οποίος για τρία χρόνια ασχολήθηκε επαγγελματικά με το Αμερικάνικο Ποδόσφαιρο, ενώ τώρα σπουδάζει για διδακτορικό στα μαθηματικά στο Ινστιτούτο Τεχνολογίας της Μασακουσέτης. Ο Τζον είναι μεγάλος θαμαστής του Σκακιού και ένας φανταστικός αθλητής. Σήμερα θα συζητήσουν το εξή θέμα. Πώ η τεχνολογία μεταμόρφωσε τον ανταγωνισμό. Thank you. Hi, welcome to a special sneak preview of next year's Nostos University, the educational programs of the Summer Nostos Festival. Inspired by the theme of the conference, which is taking place as part of the festival, which is humanity and AI, tonight we will look at how technology has transformed competition by studying the specific case of the game of chess. To do this, we've put together a most extraordinary panel. Our panel includes Gary Kasparov, Judith Polgar, and Frederick Friedel. I'd like to give a brief introduction to the first of our two panelists without giving too much away. Judith Polgar is a Hungarian chess grandmaster and is widely considered to be the greatest female chess player 
of all time. She's the only female chess player to achieve a top 10 ranking and was top, the top rated female player from 1989 all the way to 2015. Her contributions to the advancement of women in sport cannot be overstated as her accomplishments have been called one of the greatest female achievements in the 20th century. Gary Kasparov is a Russian chess grandmaster, former world champion, and is considered by many to be the greatest chess player of all time. From 1986 until his retirement in 2005, he held the number one ranking in the world for all but three months. He's well known for his affinity for computer chess, most notably his pioneering use of computers for chess preparation, and his match with the IBM supercomputer Deep Blue. Judith and Gary, welcome. Hi. Tonight, I'd like to dig into how technology has transformed competition. First, Judith and Gary, I was hoping you'd both be willing to share some details regarding your education and experiences in chess from an early age. How did you become interested in chess? And could you talk about each of your journeys to becoming a professional chess player? Well, uh, if I may start, uh, I grew up in a very special family. And by the time I started to play chess when I was five, uh, I had both of my older sisters playing already. So it was kind of uh, very natural for me to follow on my sister's activities. Susan, who is seven years older than I am, she was already competing quite well internationally. And uh, for me, it was very, very natural from day to day uh, to live in this chess atmosphere, the apartment house. Also, I didn't go to school as my other two sisters uh, were also homeschooled. So it was a very unique and special atmosphere we grew up and chess was in the focus of the family. I was born in a very ordinary family, so no siblings. And um, according to our urban legends, I was watching my uh, mother and father trying to solve a chess problem from a newspaper. And I got really interested excited about this uh, magic game and it was match made in heaven so from that very moment that happened i don't know maybe in in winter of 1968 to 1969 so i was five and a half probably i uh, got so fascinated with the game of chess and i'm still very much in love with the game and um, uh, i uh, learned very quickly and uh, though my father died when i was seven so he already made a decision to send me not to a not, not musical school, as was a tradition for the Jewish side of my family, but to, to a chess club. And since seven, I was a regular student in the Pioneer Palace in Baku. And um, it went very quickly. So jumping from uh, one category to another, and by age 10, I was already one of the top junior player in uh, um, my uh, native republic of Azerbaijan, where I was born and raised in the city of Baku. And in your sort of process from sort of young boys and girls who, who truly fell in love with the game of chess, what were your experiences like becoming professional chess players? Both of you, in some sense, were outsiders in sort of the, the field of chess. I mean, when Judith sort of became a very strong chess player, it was not typical for women to play chess at a very high level. And Gary, for you, when you were becoming a very strong chess player, Gary, you had hopes of becoming world champion, but Karpov at the time was world champion. And there was a sense that uh, people were content with, with this setup. What, do you have any comments about this? Well, uh, I grew up in a family where both of my parents uh, are teachers, so it was very clear that they uh, they knew what they want to do with us, how they want to develop us, and I learned the first few moves from my mother. Later on, I was playing chess with my father, which followed it with the teachers and coaches, and then my sisters. But I remember I played the first uh, tournament around the block when I was about six, and uh, I was uh, winning the first international competition in New York, uh, the unrated section. That was a big story on New York Times as well. And uh, to tell you the truth, I think by the age of 10, 11, it was kind of clear that I'm going to be a professional chess player. It, there were no doubts about that as I was uh, developing and uh, increasing my level very fast. 
So it is kind of very strange for me thinking that uh, what it would be if I would do something else, because it came so naturally for me. And uh, I grew up not only special, a uh, very special way from point of view that I was homeschooled, but also as a girl, I was playing against adults most of the time and most of the time against men, because my parents believed and raised me and my sisters the way that if you get the same uh, training and same opportunities as a boy, then you can reach the highest as well. And uh, I'm very thankful for this, that uh, I was growing up this way. And uh, I also try to pass it on on my daughter, that what are the expectations uh, for her in life. And uh, I think this means a lot in general from parents' point of view, that please don't limit girls what they can reach. I think it's uh, the most important thing is that they can reach the maximum they have and what they can uh, to, to reach. So for me, it was very obvious. And uh, I was very much in love with the game since uh, very little. And obviously, also because I was very successful. So I won many games, one game after another, which, of course, pushes you even more ahead. Uh, for me, the first turning point was in 1973. I was uh, selected to play for um, Azerbaijan team at the um, uh, old Soviet Youth Games in, in the city of Vilnius. Uh, I was just 10, and it was not the greatest performance, so I, uh, I won two games, I lost three, I made uh, uh, um, four draws, uh, but uh, uh, I was the youngest player in the tournament, and I was noticed uh, by my future coach, Alexander Nikitin, who recommended me to be uh, admitted to a uh, legendary Botvinnik school. And in August 1973, I met Mikhail Botvinnik, and that was a really big deal. So it's hard to explain today. That's for me, it was just, you know, uh, a trip um, uh, to, to Wonderland. And uh, um, since 1973, so I, I got uh, um, Botvinnik's attention, and uh, uh, it was a great help. And it also, um, uh, helped me back back in Baku to uh, get more coaching, and uh, by age 12 in 1976, I already won uh, all Soviet uh, junior championship under 18, which was quite a record. The next year, I repeated my success, doing it twice in a row. Um, and uh, uh, though um, the world champion type uh, champions title was, you know, um, far away. Everybody knew that I could be the most natural contender to Anatoly Korpov. Uh, of course, it involved many other stories that uh, were played not at the chessboard, but around chessboard. But uh, my uh, way to the top uh, was um, quite, you know, st straightforward. Again, there were high expectations. And I, I also believe that um, uh, that's what I could do. Um, and um, it was very natural, natural progress, you know, from year to year. So climbing at this, at, at the at this chess uh, uh, stairs to the very top of of um, chess Olympus. Interesting. And uh, for our viewers who aren't necessarily up to speed on chess, I would say that Balvinik was one of the sort of greatest chess players ever. And you could sort of relate it to a young chess player today, maybe getting the chance to learn and spend time with you, Gary, to put this into context. Yes, uh, and also it's it's the, um, but the next influence was not just on my chess game, but also on the way I viewed the game. And uh, I, ever since I believe that it was a responsibility of a top player to help uh, new generations. So uh, when I became world champion, I uh, uh, um, asked Botvinnik to restart our, our joint program now. And uh, so many great players came out of our, of our effort uh, in 80, um, 86, 87. So including Vladimir Kramnik or Alexei Shirov and many others. It's, it's a very long, long list of, of grandmasters. Uh, and uh, uh, in early uh, uh, early 21st century, so I started uh, my um, uh, foundation here in the United States, and it's spread out around the world. And I feel, you know, that is it's some sort of my duty to help younger players to learn from me the same way I learned from Botvinnik and other great Soviet players. No, no, that's that's perfectly on point. And in fact, this sort of shifts towards our next topic: the concept of sort of preparing for chess competition and how this has really changed over time. I mean, 
okay, I don't want to you know speak for you, but I, I like to believe that more or less what you're saying is that early on in your career, Gary, there was sort of a lack of information. There were, you know, you sort of waited to get these periodicals that contained chess games, that contained analysis. Whereas these days, there are sort of these large databases that contain games. There are engines that give you sort of easy access to sort of analysis. How did the two of you prepare for chess competition sort of throughout your careers? And in many ways, how did this change over time? Well, for me, sport was, uh, of course, starting already very early in, in my age. And I, in the beginning, I took uh, chess as a game in the beginning, obviously. Then it was also sport, very fast. It was a competition. But also science and research was always uh, somewhat uh, very important uh, during my, uh, my years in competition. And it was interesting that the way I grew up with the uh, uh, the trainers. I was solving a lot of tactical uh, positions. I was developing my opening repertoire as well. But still, I was always focusing and most of my uh, play was very creative all the time. And this was, I was always very natural for me and I was kind of proud of it. I was always looking for creative, unusual ideas. And uh, opening theory was not very much my piece of bread. It was, uh, well, contrary to Gary, who was uh, the leader in the world in uh, creating uh, opening theory. But uh, so sport uh, aspect, of course, it was the main part of, of my life. But I always like to dig into the artistic part of the sport. And of course, later on, uh, we will touch the topic about the computers, how it involved the preparation and the mindset of a, of a, a player. Because uh, in the very beginning, when I started to play chess, you have to visualize it that I had the chess board front of me. Usually I had a partner sitting opposite uh, to me. Many times it was my sister or later on my older sister when I got better or we had trainers. And then uh, when we were analyzing some situations, whether it's opening or middle game or end game of the game and analyzing of big champions games, I remember following Gary's World Championship match with Karpov. It was uh, so special to, to watch it and follow it. All those thoughts, what we had, we were writing down on a piece of paper and we were waiting the new magazines and books to arrive and to learn from that. And of course, it shifted to a completely different world when we started to have the, the technology involved in, in chess. So I liked very much the creative part and, and when, when all the aspects uh, are really part of the game, the psychology, the preparation, home preparation, your mindset, your physical preparation, uh, the situation of the tournament, how do you handle a victory, how do you overcome on a bad situation, a bad game, a struggle, or how do you handle if you win the first few games and you're leading in a tournament, but you have to still hang on and, and, and keep these strengths and move forward. So the, the sport aspect of the game is, uh, is wonderful, but I think the game itself changed uh, more or less to another game, if we can say, in the last uh, two decades. Um, yeah, just, you know, echoing what Judy just said, so I, I'm just smiling because it's, I um, remember so, the way I've been preparing in the 70s. Uh, now, information was available to some magazines, but, you know, it was very slow, of course. And uh, again, it's just, it's the, um, it's the, the volume of information was, was, was so, so you know, tiny compared to what, what we can have today, you know, just uh, by just swiping uh, our, our finger, you know, um, on a screen. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, the way I prepared for, uh, for some games and, and, and uh, looked for some openings, I had to collect the games. I, I was recording these games, you know, and I remember that uh, my uh, coach Alexander Nikitin sent me from Moscow a special set to print diagrams. I printed diagrams and then put pieces there. So it's all <laughs> handmade. So it's, it sounds like, you know, it's a stone age, but that's the way we worked in, in the 70s. I, my mother still keeps, you know, the, the, uh, um, the notebooks 
you know, the, this with, you know, with uh, my handwriting. So this is collecting games of the top players. And those were, you know, some kind of tests to, uh, to understand so uh, your, your, your dedication to the game because it took time, hours. But it also helped. And, of course, we had a chess set. I mean, nobody knew about computers at all. So, and, and uh, every book, you know, was something that, you know, you, you treasured. Because most of these books, you know, we read, you know, from, you know, uh, top to bottom, from bottom to top. So this is just, you know, from first page to the last. Uh, it's, um, uh, it, you know, uh, it's, it, it, it was a different world. But it actually probably gave us sort of a stronger um, um, impulse. For, for, for the future. Um, and uh, also, my coaches had, you know, influence on me, both Alexander Nikitin and in Baku, Alexander Shakarov, but of course, Botvinnik. They were all um, um, extra specialists in the opening. So they wanted to analyze. So this is, that's the analytical skills that I, I had my own passion, but with, you know, with so much influence around me, I concentrated more and more on just digging deeper and deeper in the openings. Though when I just you know uh, looked at uh, my um, special um, notes for the World Championship match, as Judith mentioned, 84, 85, something that we were so proud, you know, that's this our great analysis. And now you put it on the computer, uh, <laughs> you just you don't <laughs> want to see machines, <laughs> machines reaction screaming. You know, it's mm -hmm. it's it's very interesting because we thought in in uh, late 70s and early 80s, mid 80s, even late 80s that we, we had something so precious, so powerful. It's like we believed that I had this, uh, as I had this you know, uh, uh, King's author sword, but actually it was a broken knife. <laughs> it, was just, it, it, was, it was so primitive. But this is something that, you know, that's the, uh, I would probably, you know, um, put uh, um, as another form of a law or just, you know, a formula. You know, if you do a lot of work, and it's it's later you discover that this work not, was not probably you know the the of uh, the best quality. Still, somehow magically, this work helps you to achieve results. Very often, I entered the game having an idea that later machine refuted, and it didn't happen on the board. But somehow, the hours and hours and hours of work that I I um, uh, um, invested in analyzing this position and this opening helped me to uh, win the game uh, that, that, that went in a different direction. No, I think, like that's, uh, I think that's, uh, go ahead. No, sorry, I just, uh, it's, it's uh, so nice to listen, Gary, how passionately he's describing his use and he's, I'm sure you visualize it front of you, the stories you're talking <laughs> about. And uh, I, I always wonder, I mean, you have kids, I have kids, that how much are they engaged in what they are doing? Because I remember when I was engaged with daily, so much everything was around chess. And uh, for the people who are not playing chess, they may only think that it's only moves, pieces moving, and what's the difference between one or another, right? But for us, it was the nuances, the small details. It was really giving us great pleasure, right? But what was also interesting for me, what uh, you were describing when I was talking about my middle game and my creativity, and you were telling that your coaches were very much in the analytical attitude, and that's what you brought from already from a very young age, right? And I think yes. this is something very important to, to point out that it is so important, where do we start? What is the starting point? Who are our teachers? And what are the expectations, right? Because for me, for example, it was my father who loved all these tactical ideas and he was showing the evergreen game and later on your games, of course, and, and uh, those very spectacular ones. So that was the direction I was steering by my father. And also he was the, he had the aim to have teachers to guide me on that direction. And opening preparation was absolutely not important. I mean, I'm kind of embarrassed to say front of Gary that, but he knows it, that I was playing the King's Gambit opening, which is uh, softly saying it's not the best opening, until almost I became a grandmaster level. So I was very much behind in opening thinking, in theory, compared to you, for example, because you had already this very structured, very systematic way of thinking, right? Of course, you had all the creativity, amazing uh, 
ideas, way of thinking, etc. But still, I think it is it is so important already at a very young age what kind of teachers and guidance you get from your mentors or coaches. Okay, I think at this point we uh, we had better bring out our third panelist. We've already touched a little bit on technology, and I think it would be a disservice to this uh, to this conversation if we don't bring out Frederick Friedel. Frederick is a co-founder of the chess database company Chessbase, a groundbreaking software which is more or less universally accepted as the primary program used by chess players worldwide to study the opening moves of chess and to prepare for specific opponents. Fred, how are you? I'm, I'm fine in lockdown. See, like like the rest I, of us. I would like to I would like to mention that this development uh, came about exactly 35 years ago, and uh, responsible for this was among others Gary here, because there <laughs> he came to my home in June or July. 1985, made friends with me and my family in about seven minutes, and then sat down and said, okay, tell me everything you know about computers. I told him everything I knew about computers, and he told me everything that computers should be doing for chess. And we designed a database. And uh, then, with his encouragement, luckily I found a very good programmer, and with his encouragement, we created Chessbase, and in 1986, we launched it. And I would like to remind you that Gary had a, a unique uh, position in the chess world. He had more information than most other chess players, than all other chess players, because he had seconds and uh, grandmasters helping him and so on. But he made it a democratic movement. He got that kind of preparation for all chess players. You know, normally if you have a racket in chess, in tennis or something, which is just superior to everything else, you don't immediately say, well, everyone should have this kind of a racket. He dem democratized chess learning. So thanks for that. And since then, you know, we've developed this program and it's the standard every chess player uses it to prepare. And this was partially his responsibility. Gary, that's that's actually really fascinating to me. I mean, okay, in most sports, you imagine you're, you're a sports team or you're a sports player and you have some significant competitive advantage, like the access to, you know, a large database of games. And you share this with all other players. Could you discuss sort of what your yes. sort of feelings about this work? This is... This is actually like mind blowing to me. I have to say. No, Fred, thank you very much for your flattering comments. But uh, yeah, I just you know I had no idea of benefiting the whole you know uh, world of chess and all my all my comp uh, uh, competitors. I just believed it was a natural development for our game because I already you know I, I could see immediately what you know what would be the uh, the the result of merging chess databases that we had in our notebooks, you know, the very primitive databases, with, uh, with machines. And I thought it would, you know, it would move our game, you know, to, to a new level. I think I was right. Um, and um, it's, I, I think I was lucky and the world of chess was lucky that I found Fred in June 1985, so in, in Hamburg, who was listening very carefully and who was also lucky to find us good programmers. And uh, by the end of 1986, the chess base was ready. And uh, I think the first test of the program was in, I think, in February 1987. Uh, that, that, and unless I'm wrong, where I just tested it by preparing for the simultaneous exhibition against Swiss national team. Um, no, it's, no, it was. No, it wasn't. It was in January, and you had played a simultaneous, a clock simultaneous against the Hamburg team, and you had lost, and you had the only simul you had ever lost in your life. It's a clock simul. Uh, Fred, 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 you, Fred, yeah? Fred, I lost this match against Hamburg in yeah. December, yes. 1985, and, you, and, you and then saw, it was rematch uh, in February 1987. I mean, yes. my and memory is still good enough to remember... Yeah. 
you know, all my losses at least. <laughs> yes. But you, but you <laughs> swore, but you swore revenge, and you came yes. back to Hamburg and you played an, against an even stronger team, eight players, grandmasters, and IMs and so on, and we prepared with Chesspace 1.0, the very first version of the program, and he spent a day and a half or two days. Uh, preparing for these eight players, and then he went in and crushed them seven to one. And this was the result. He knew them all. He knew exactly what their weaknesses were, what their strengths were, the openings they liked or disliked, and everything. And it was for us a proof. My goodness, he loses it in one case. He was very tired and so on. And then he comes back and with preparation, proper preparation, he can slaughter them six to one, no, seven to one. And that's when we launched the program. And also with his encouragement, he kept telling us, you have to commercialize this for heaven's sake. So I'm curious, now that, you know, in the current modern age, now that every single player, even amateur players, have access to large chess databases, have access to extremely powerful engines, how has this changed the game of chess in the sense that, how has it changed the way that a top player obtains a competitive advantage, let's say? Well, first of all, uh, what I have uh, seen in the past two years is that there are a number of chess players, all grandmaster strength. Some of them have the title, some not yet. And they're all around 12 or 13 years old. Now, I've worked with them. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine I tell you about a quantum physicist who's 12 years old? Now, this is a chess grandmaster. He's 12 years old. And you find out how did they do it? Well, they had seven and a half million games. They had instant access. They could learn from with the help of the computer. They had a trainer, but the main work was with the computer. So it was possible. And the chess engines are very, very important as well. Because you can always ask the computer, why not something? Or what if something? Two main questions in, in chess. And it tells you immediately, and at a very, very high level, 3,500 ELO level. In what way can sort of having something that tells you the answer immediately, just from a click, in what way can that be sort of a double-edged sword? If you don't mind, I'm curious, are there any sort of like unintended consequences of this <laughs> technology? Is there any extent to which technology can pose a barrier to chess improvement, let's say? Well, tens of thousands of people do not profit tremendously from it, but 1% does, and that is the percent you see playing on in top tournaments. Every technology has upsides and downsides, and uh, as Fred pointed out, now you could have grandmasters at age 12. Um, it was absolutely impossible 30, 40 years ago because you had to just play in one tournament and then in a stronger tournament to gain more experience. Now you have everything, you know, at your elbow or just or it's on, on your screen. And uh, um, they can quickly, you know, accumulate this critical knowledge to uh, um, become strong players. And also they have a lot of uh, fresh energy, energy of, the, of, of use. Um, but at the same time, uh, I could see um, downsides of this effect. Because most of this information is, is just, you know, it's taken from the screen. And uh, in many instances, the young, strong players, they become kind of hostages of, of computers. So they, um, uh, they are almost enslaved because they look at the screen and they, the way they think, the way they just, you know, they, they, they project their moves, it's, it's a reflection of, of, of a machine thinking. So the creativity, human creativity, somehow is suffering. So and that's the that's that's a problem. Um, and uh, uh, very few players, I mean, Magnus Carlsen definitely is, is, is the best example, can actually resist the pressure from the screen. They can look at the screen, they can uh, 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 receive recommendations, but without being totally, you know, swamped by the power of the machine. Because as Fred pointed out, computers are so much stronger today. So this is it's 3500 rating. So it's there's no competition. 
And, uh, and in, in, it's clearly that, you know, machine recommendation is always superior uh, to what humans can suggest. But still, you know, if we are preparing for a match human versus human, so then, then you need, you know, you need certain human characteristics to be preserved. Well, actually, I would add, like, uh, when I was a, a kid and we were talking before about the classical old way of uh, learning chess, and I think Gary also had a huge database on paper, paper-based uh, collection of games yeah. before the computer time, right? I had, uh, my father made a huge job with my mother also making uh, 100,000 games maybe, and each game was on a card, and it was selected, sorted out by names, by players, by codes, which chess has different openings. So that is how we were developing our knowledge that let's say I was uh, preparing for a tournament or developing, learning a new opening system. Then I was taking out those 200 games and one by one, I was really watching it by playing it on the board physically. So actually, it was also going into my head in a completely different way. I got a much more engaging moments with the moves, with the ideas. Uh, so it was a very slow motion compared to now, when all these games which I had on paper, which Gary had on paper, and all the other top players, they were all having this, like my small luggage, it was, I always took it on the on board because of course I didn't uh, check them because if it, I, I would lose it, then it would be end of the world, right? So it was, uh, it was so different those times. And then later on when we had the databases, I remember early 90s or late uh, 80s with 3000 games, the first floppy disk. <laughs> I mean, it was kind of <laughs> funny. And the big difference is for chess players that while when it was on paper-based material, I mean, you can have only certain amount of books and papers on your desktop. But in the, in the computer, we have right now already 15 million games maybe, and you can sort it by, by moves, by positions, by players, and all the information, you have much more information. So when you work, you don't necessarily able to sort out, to filter out only the quality stuff, because it's not extra kilos. It's, I mean, you have all the memory in your computer. And I think the, the, this generation is growing up very differently compared to me, for example, when I was already very much into professional chess, and I had to shift from paper to technology. And also with the engines, it was so different. When it was only the first engine, for example, it was interesting, we were curious, it was giving nice ideas, it already very early pinpointed our mistakes, especially my calculations. I had great, interesting ideas if I play against a human. But unfortunately, the computer pinpointed very much my mistakes, the holes in my calculation. So it was not uh, very much fun to play against computer for me. But it was also that by now, they judge the position. They evaluate already much more correctly. I have an example when, for example, I played against one of the best uh, English player, Michael Adams, and he played an opening of Martial Attack, which is uh, which uh, where uh, he's sacrificing material and for for interesting play. And uh, I was working with the computer before the game. I was with an engine, and uh, the evaluation said that I'm winning. So I went to the game. And uh, I exactly could make this surprising move, which I planned with the computer. And then he was surprised, but he reacted in a good way. And I didn't see more than a draw, but I thought, oh, but the computer said that I'm winning, so there must be a win. And I went out of the draw option and I went on to play the game. And it was a huge mistake. So in those times, it was uh, it was uh, very difficult to trust the computer, but I think we are over on those times already. And now the youngsters, they know exactly what to expect from an engine about evaluation, about uh, different kind of move suggestion also. So there are different times on the development of computer. Gotcha. Yeah, you... Uh... You're certainly not the last certainly famous the chess player to sort of, uh, to sort of have bad preparation against bad the martial attack, certainly. But uh, I'd like to sort of 
shift this sort of panel just a little bit. And I, I was wondering if we could really start to think more broadly. And I'd like to ask all three of you, in what ways has the field of chess and the influence of technology been a case study for other disciplines as to how to work with technology? Um, oh, um, no, I think chess was, uh, was really a case study uh, because we could find a way of sort of merging our creativity with machines brute force. And um, I pioneered it in, in mid-90s, when machines were decent enough to actually to, to check our analysis, not to be too creative. So I think the first game uh, uh, played at the, at, the, at the top level World Championship match again uh, I, in New York in 1995, I played against Wish Annan. So where I had great idea and I used computer, still very primitive, but to uh, verify that the combination worked. Uh, and uh, later on, so I, uh, I, you know, I used it more and more um, uh, um, effectively by just, you know, not just checking lines, but also looking for for some some ideas. And by the end of the 20th century, early 21st century, it became normal practice. So nobody worked at the openings without uh, without uh, chess computers. Um, and then, as Judith pointed out, so there's, they, they, there were some moments where the machine's recommendations had to be taken with caution. I think the, the biggest disaster was, I guess, Kramnik uh, game against uh, Aleko in the World Championship match. Um, yeah, and uh, I think it was also martial attack. Yeah, it's this. Yeah, and, and uh, Kramnik and his team made an analysis. I think it's, it happens uh, all, all the time. You are in a rush, you know, and all of a sudden, you know, maybe an hour before the game, machine shows you the great line. And Kronik went for that without checking it, and <laughs> then machine said sorry. <laughs> so it's, it, it was not a win, it was actually a loss. So, um, but, uh, but now we reached a point where we all know that machine recommendation is it's like it's coming from Oracle. It is, this is the, you don't, you, you know, you, you don't have to, to, to challenge it. And the young players, they're very good in anticipating. So what is exactly, you know, just to expect from this machine in, the, in, in, in this position? Well, I also think, uh, for example, that the game uh, changed quite a bit because of this trust towards the computers and engines. I mean, uh, I see many uh, games which is developed completely differently than, let's say, 10 years ago. Because uh, in chess, you can choose different styles, whether you go for an, uh, for an opening or a middle game where you feel comfortable, you know more or less how things are, where you have to place your pieces to, to work out well. And in sharp, concrete, concrete lines, many people were trying to avoid because maybe they were afraid that the other one has a bigger team, they have better helpers, better computers. But by now, I think... Uh, Many people have uh, higher self-confidence because they know that they have their, their team of, uh, of a computer and the computers usually work for many of the top players 24-7 because the engines, they, they make uh, the engine work and they give suggestions. And once they are analyzing and looking at very carefully all these data and suggestion and evaluation, they decide, okay, why not? If I worked on it enough, if I have a good engine, I trust my engine, I have a great computer, great processor, I know all the database, whatever happened in the whole world in the uh, yesterday or just an hour before, it also makes a huge difference. And people are taking much more risk in some ways, but of course, eventually your preparation stops, right? So many times it happens that you work out your preparation until the first 15 move or even first 18 move, and you have all the confidence, but after that you're on your own to decide how you go on in complicated positions. So I also feel that many of the chess players, they are more open to go on their beliefs. And uh, I, to tell you the truth, many people were telling me that uh, computers are killing chess. And I feel the contrary, that uh, there are, I think, much more interesting games going on than, let's say, before. Because uh, simply because of the help of the computer, or at least the, the same amount of, uh, of games which uh, is engaged from the fans' point of view, I think. 
Many chess fans are complaining these days that the openings are not as exciting as it used to be when Judy and I played some very sharp openings, trying to seize initiative and uh, sacrifice material. Uh, because you know, computers now can tell you that uh, some of the great lines that we enjoyed so much analyzing and playing have been refuted. So I can give you a few examples of, um, of the lines that have been extensively analyzed over decades by top players. Uh, I even remember preparing one of these lines um, uh, in year 2000 against Vladimir Kramnik. And now Chess Engine, within a minute or less, can tell you, sorry, you know, forget about it, throw it in the garbage. Um, and that's why you could see top players, they're selecting more solid openings, making sure that they can avoid an, a disaster. Uh, though some, you know, some of them are just uh, still have a face in their ability to out-prepare the opponent, but you have, you have less and less opening duels the same way we had, we had before. But there is also an upside, because you, know, you have chess amateurs, the same chess fans who are complaining that chess is not, not so exciting. Now, uh, all of a sudden, they can understand what's happening at the chessboard. When I played Karpov, for instance, I remember even top grandmasters uh, who, may, may, who were making commentaries of the games, they were very shy to criticize Karpov or myself, even if we made an op you know, a, a clear mistake. Yeah, some blunders, they, they can accept it. It was bad. But, you know, the moves that were definitely of second rate, they, they didn't think that they could criticize because it's like, you know, criticizing gods. Now, you can see top, <laughs> you know, top players, you know, competing, and machine shows that Magnus Carlsen made a mistake, and uh, you hear, you know, internet is laughing loud because everybody knows Magnus made a mistake. Um, and somehow, you know, uh, it, 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 I, I feel irritated because how come that this is, this, this, the army of amateurs is there to criticize the world champion? But at the same time, I understand it helps the game of chess to, to, to um, uh, bring more people in because now you don't even need a commentary of, of a top GM. You can simply look at your screen and understand exactly what's happening in the game between, say, Magnus and, and Fabiano. I'd like to say something uh, which was Gary was saying, and it's so interesting that really opening preparation is very much so different. It was transforming so much with the computers. But also I think, which is, which is very important to note, I just realized by listening, Gary, that uh, in chess, intuition was so important, right? I mean, before we really had this great intuition, you had to fill the position, you had to know all the ins and outs of the different systems in order to make the right decision, even an early opening phase or in the middle game or later stage of the game. And with the computers and the computer preparation in, in openings, I think simply intuition is gone, is disappeared because in opening, Preparation, if a computer suggests an interesting idea or, or another engine suggests it, we don't say anymore that, no, this is impossible. While we, when we were living without the engines, it was something very common, especially when I was weaker. When I was asking a more stronger player, they said, no, this is impossible. No, this is not the spirit of the position. And nowadays in opening preparation, you don't have something like this that you just ignore it. If the engine suggests it, maybe you say, well, I don't think so, but maybe. Uh, could I, uh, Judith could said I something, something very, very important. Yeah, sure. The words in the spirit of the position. That's, you know, you don't hear it from the young players. They, I, 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 I bet you most of them don't understand what it means. What do you mean spirit of the position? Machine said it. Machine, you know, machine recommends it. And I hear it very often from young players so they just follow the lines of the, of, of, of the computer and, and they just, you know, they say, I did it and it was not a good move. And machine said, you know, I had to do something else. And my question, why? It just, it's just, it's, it's, it's it has almost shocking effect because they don't understand the question. What do you mean, why? Because machine said so. And, uh, and the spirit of the position, the nature of the position, the, uh, you know, this, like, you know, the, the, I would say, the demand of the position. Those are the terms that are used by, you know, by retired play, players like us. <laughs> so we're talking about chess from a different age. 
But at the same time, you know, it's, it's what makes the difference between some really top players today and the rest of the field. And Magnus, I, as I did, in, indicated, he has an ability to resist the pressure from the computer. So he, he understands his language. And I think some of other top players also do understand the language. And that's, you know, that separates them from the rest of the field. They will the uh, players uh, uh, you know, uh, on just, you know, on number 20, 30, 40, 50. They have access to the same computers. But it's not, you know, the same way they can use it. Because somehow this intuition that Judith mentioned still matters when you are just, you know, uh, making decisions at the board. I think uh, just interesting discussion, certainly, that I think also that uh, uh, what is a very important thing for youth players and generally for players, and probably not only in chess, but in everything, that when we use computers, we tend to believe everything what it says. And if you can keep yourself being a critical thinker, then you can get the maximum out of computer, I think. Because it's great of the suggestion, but still you have to be the boss and you have to make the decision. And this is how it shifted so differently in modern chess. Because while in the beginning it was like 20 years ago, it was me, it was my trainer. Now it's the computer which gives the suggestion. So actually a top player must be able to be a leader, a boss, and choose from which kind of idea which the computer was suggesting, I'm interested on that because I think on that direction I want more information to be able to decide. But you have to be extremely critical because, and I think this is why Magnus is so good, because he listens to the computer suggestion, he's watching, but he will going to say that I believe this is not correct and I have all the self-confidence and believe in myself doing it differently. And it goes for everything in in uh, regarding technology, I believe. Okay, I think now is a uh, is a good time to bring Haristos back. Haristos, so earlier on in this panel, we talked a little bit about sort of influences of sort of great players, and for Gary, the influence that Bob Vinick had. Could you talk a little bit about some of the influences that you had in your chess career, especially early on? Mm-hmm. Uh, gladly. There is a story I would like to share with you. Back in uh, 1988, uh, when the Chess Olympiad was held in Thessaloniki, this is my hometown, I was uh, 10 years old and it was my first year in uh, the chess board. So I was playing an amateur tournament uh, right next to where the Olympiad was taking place. So when I was finishing my own games, I remember, I had the opportunity to watch these chess legends like Gary and Judy play. I still remember only the sound of the chest ticking, of the clock ticking, and uh, watching you know, the closing ceremony. That experience really inspired me as a child, and uh, little did I know that uh, many years later, I had the opportunity to play my own Olympiad myself. This is how I started chess, actually. That's a true oh, story. And uh, Hersos, you have some, uh, do you have some questions for Judith and Gary from Yes, I'm question. yes, yes, uh, because it's clear that the technology affects uh, the way people, uh, the young people are thinking. Uh, how should a chess trainer inspire the, the same kind of passion to their children, to their students? How it's possible? Because with the use of computer, we know the difficulties. This is my question. How should we should inspire the, our students? Well, I think, uh, generally speaking, you can't forbid the kids to go on and check things on the computer and play with the computer. But uh, I would say that uh, also in other things, not only in chess, I believe that it's very important to have uh, blended things, that simply you have off-the-board activities and then some computer and online activities. And more in the beginning for kids, it's important to double check the information once what they performed on the board, like they solve puzzles or problems. I think it's good to check it or even to make a puzzle uh, to, to solve things. It is very useful on the computer. But when they start to work on openings, I think it's extremely important to really to fill the position 
what kind of moves and why you're doing those things and how can you find harmony in your position, in your game. And it's uh, it's also very important not to focus only in the opening, but to play all the way out to the middle game, the end game, to experience that you make mistakes. After that, you can correct it most of the time, but sometimes you're going to lose, sometimes you're going to win. So I think it's very important to to really make them play on the board and experience the tournament situation and also that they have to be okay with themselves making a mistake and get over and uh, and not to see only the screen because that can be very dangerous even in my preparations i felt it many times that i was preparing watching the screen and then at the board two hours later i don't remember that somehow what what, what was my preparation so things you, things are simply so much faster on the screen so it's better to to watch it on the board as well. I agree that you know you have to find the right balance between using the screen and, and computers and and uh, a real chess board, so the wooden chess board and pieces. Um, I would also suggest that you try to limit. I don't know if it's do or not uh, the online blitz, um, especially you know that's uh, under three minutes, because that just that's it's it's not good for for the way they uh, they learn about chess, because it's all about you know just pushing the pieces. So you definitely have to sort of minimize the, the the role of the dexterity of hands, because some of them are so good at just using the mouse. So and but it's not about you know making sure that you move the mouse faster than your opponent. It's about quality of your moves. So internet also offers many uh, many uh, um, options of learning chess by by start, by doing tactics. So that's the so find the right way, right balance between between um, um, encouraging them to learn through internet rather than uh, simply you know just pushing the pieces and just succeeding by just by uh, uh, um, knocking opponents opponents. I won't say flag, but it's just it's 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 not a flag, but it's basically in many games you know they just they're specializing on making you know uh, uh, three four five moves in one second. But again, it nothing to do with learning of the game of chess. And I think it has a very negative psychological effect on them because their energy goes in the wrong direction. So make sure that that's the, the machines do not kill their passion for the game of chess uh, in favor of uh, uh, short-lived uh, use, useless successes uh, on Internet Blitz. Maybe we can put the questions of my students. I have a lot of questions of my students, if you would like, because they would love uh, your ideas and your answers to their questions, which is fantastic. Hello, my name is Panagiotta Kius, and I would like to ask Mrs. Polkar a question. Well, have you made any sacrifice in order to become a chess champion? I think you always make sacrifices, but uh, most of the time, I think, uh, when you love something and you're so dedicated and passionate about something, you don't feel it. You only feel it uh, maybe much later, or maybe people see it as a sacrifice. Other people are uh, judging you or criticizing you, or they were criticizing my parents, for example, that I didn't get uh, a regular childhood. But for me, it was not a sacrifice because uh, I gained all these possibilities that I could travel all over the world. I was successful from a very young age. And I won so many games and so many tournaments that it gave so much pleasure to me. But of course, uh, whenever you want to reach something serious, something high, you have to make compromises or something has to be so important for you that you don't feel it as a sacrifice. But I was sacrificing a lot on the chessboard of my pieces. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Gaspar. My name is Philippe. We all know about your match against IBM's Deep Blue. So, I would like to ask, do you think that the engines have caused the game its magic? As we discussed in this program, uh, machines uh, revealed so many secrets. Um, and um, you may call it magic or mysteries of the game of chess. They, they've gone because, you know, you could see it through the um, eyes of a computer, so the lenses of the computer. And even an amateur can actually understand immediately what's happening at the chessboard thanks to the machine's um, advice. But I have a simple you know, recommendation how to restore the magic. Just follow the games of the top players without the computer. 
and the magic is back because you will be still mesmerized by the great ideas of the top players and you know try to make sure that you will follow it as much as you can and i tell you i can guarantee there will be so much magic uh, for you because most of the ideas that you will be seeing uh, at the chess board in the game of the top players they will be very hard for you to grasp I would like to ask you, Ms. Polker, if there was a time when you played competitive chess that you thought of retiring because the stress and the pressure was too much? And if yes, what kept you going? Thank you. I had a long career, more than 30 years. And to tell you the truth, uh, for many, many years, I did never thought about something like that to stop uh, the game. But uh, in the year 2000, uh, from 99 to 2000, there I had some crisis and I had maybe some other crisis as well. When I was suffering from my own play, I was so unhappy with the way I was thinking. I was uh, the direction I was taking in my chess path. And uh, I was kind of um, sad and I didn't know what to do. But I never thought about that, uh, that I would be stopping at that uh, moment, in these critical moments. And uh, what uh, pushed me going on, it was always my family, my uh, sisters. Of course, they were supporting me very much. They gave a lot of energy and support in every way, emotionally and also chess advice. Later on, my husband. And uh, also coaches. And also sometimes it had to be myself thinking over the actions I was taking lately and I had to understand and analyze myself why I was not happy the way I was competing, the way I was playing, the the way I was choosing my openings, making my decisions. And if you can be critical about yourself and about the situation for what you're in at that moment when you are uh, hesitating where you have to move, whether you have to move on or you have to quit, I think it's very important to calm down and be objective about yourself. What are your goals? What you really want to be? What you really want to do? And evaluate how much happiness uh, it gives to you. And uh, I think if you have already quite a lot of success, you will understand it, that the success is what you reach. They are much more valuable than actually the feelings you have in that uh, critical moment. And then you can come over it uh, much easier. Hello, my chess rating is near 1-9 and I would like to know how to handle the pressure when I'm playing against the IM or GM. Thank you. But the good news is that he's already playing IMs and GMs. That's very, very helpful. So I wish, you know, I had the same opportunity when I was 10. Um, so uh, probably I'm the wrong person to answer the question because I um, never looked at my opponent as I am GM, the title rating. I played against the opponent's king of opposite color. And um, I can advise, you know, that's the, uh, you always, you know, believe, you always um, um, believe that the outcome of the game depends on the quality of your own play. Um, so it's, it's, it's about your own confidence. So try to ignore the opponent who is sitting uh, um, across the board um, from you. Um, whether he or she is much stronger, rating, title, ignore it. It's, it's, it's about quality of the moves in this very game. And uh, I think it helps. You know, it's, it's your game. And uh, what happens you know, during the game very much depends on your ability to play well. So don't let other emotions Uh, fear, anxiety, uh, or um, respect for, for your opponent to interfere with um, your decisions. Very nice. Judith, would you like to, to say anything about this or not? Or continue? Yes, I think, I think it's very important to set your goals very high because it keeps you motivating. But it's also very important to have smaller goals, which are reachable, and uh, for to support your self-confidence. So I would advise to play on the same level or a little bit better players than uh, uh, he himself and really focus on the game. As Gary said, that play the moves, play the game, be that 
have the dedication for the game, the love for the game, study every day, quite a few hours, as much as you have. And, uh, and, and with time and with experience, you can get better from day by day to reach better results. And later on, maybe you can conquer even grandmasters. You are very correct. You are very correct in this very wise decision. Okay, so let's go back to John. Gary and Judith, thank you for those very insightful answers. First of all, I want to say thank you to everyone on the panel. Gary, Judith, Aristos, Fred, thank you for taking the time. And I'd like to say thank you to everyone watching. And we all look forward to seeing you next year in Athens. Let it be. Thank you. Let it be. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank <laughs> you.